are y'all? Um, well, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm glad I updated my bio because my um, title just recently changed. So I updated it and you pulled the new one, which is exciting. <laughs> um, I'm thrilled to be here with y'all this morning. Um, I, um, as, as was mentioned, um, am um, a graduate of Candler in the Masters of Religion and Public Life program. Um, and um, was in the very first um, cohort of that program that, that finished. Um, when I finished my MSW uh, in 2012, I knew I wanted to add a faith component to that, um, but I didn't think I wanted to add a full MDiv. I knew that my ministry and my calling was, um, was out in the world, out in the community, um, and an MDiv deacon track could have done that, but it, it just it, it wasn't quite right. And, they had this, um, this little button on their website for like four years that said Masters of Religion and Public Life coming soon. And so for four years, <laughs> every month or so, I would click in and I would say, um, see if it was updated. And, and finally, in the, the fall of 2014, um, it said coming in January. And I filled out my application and got that in and was in the first cohort that finished that program. Um, which was just so wonderful because it was an opportunity to really dive into the intersect um, between faith communities and nonprofits um, and do a lot of research and a lot of deep diving into how we can do mission and ministry and community engagement better, um, both on a local and on a global level. Um, today, obviously, I'll be talking about um, the local level um, and in-town collaborative ministries. And so just thrilled, thrilled to be here with y'all today. Um, okay, yep, this slide just has our website, our handles. If you don't follow us on social media, we would love for you to do that. Um, we, um, we do a lot of sharing um, of our client stories and of specific um, interrelational stories um, and, and really try and be a vision of, of what our organization believes on our social media. So. Um, it's not just um, calls for, for money and support. Um, it's a lot of, um, of sharing the stories um, that we'll talk about the concepts behind today. Um, so what we're going to do today, I'm going to do an overview of M-Town um, and go a little bit into why we do the things the way we do them. Um, and then at the end, we're going to talk um, about some of the concepts behind our mission, our vision, our philosophy, um, because I know that this is part of the your Transforming the World series, and so we want to talk not just about the what we're doing, but about the why behind we're doing it. So um, we'll, we'll do both, both of those pieces this morning, and, um, and I'm thrilled to be here with y'all. Um, so in town's mission um, at, at, at just like the highest level is to prevent and reverse homelessness and hunger in in-town Atlanta. Um, it's big. It's a big mission, a big vision. Um, our vision is a thriving community that is equipped to provide prompt and effective support for those experiencing homelessness and hunger in our community. Over the last 10 years, we really have grown from being a neighborhood organization to a citywide organization um, and support for, um, for, for those throughout the city of Atlanta, um, both in our hunger and our homeless outreach ministries. Um, we used to, our, our mission used to end with in the 300, no, in the 30306 and 30307 zip codes. Um, and with our, with our growth, with our support from our community, we've been able to expand that mission to really include the entire city of Atlanta on both the, our, on the homeless outreach side and, and metro Atlanta on the hunger side, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. Our values, um, our dignity, relationships, accountability, empowerment, and sustainability. And we really do work to make sure that those are not just buzzwords, that we really are um, ensuring that our clients are, are seen as, um, as full and, and, and um, complete people um, experiencing a situation that we're able to help with, um, rather than a population that we're trying to fix or uh, change or um, eradicate um, and, and working with each individual person um, to, um, to impact their experience. So in brief, what we do is we work to end homelessness for individuals and to fight hunger. Um, 
We provide street outs for people experiencing especially unsheltered and chronic homelessness, and then we provide dignified, low-barrier food pantry and grocery deliveries for our neighbors experiencing food insecurity. And we talk about food insecurity and hunger as two different things. We all experience hunger on a daily basis, sometimes many, many times a day, um, but we don't necessarily all experience food insecurity or food insufficiency. Um, and so what In Town does is we're not just working to fight hunger, we're working to end food insecurity and make sure that folks know the next time they are hungry, they have food to put in their bodies. First, we're gonna talk about homelessness in Atlanta and our homeless services programs. Um, so this, um, this slide is, just wanna make sure that I'm still looking at the same thing y'all are looking at. This slide is from the most recent uh, point in time count from the city of Atlanta. So a night in January every year, people across the city of Atlanta go out and literally count the people that they find on the street experiencing homelessness. Um, there's also a count of folks that are sheltered um, in shelters, in family shelters, in uh, transitional housing opportunities. Um, but the, the night in January is counting the people that are literally sleeping outside in Atlanta. Um, most of those folks are chronically homeless. And so chronic homelessness means that you've been experiencing homelessness for either a year or four times in the last three years, and you have a disabling condition, and that can be a physically disabling condition or a mental health condition. In town, bread and butter, our main population that we work with is folks experiencing chronic homelessness. And as you can see in January, um, almost half of our community experiencing homelessness in Atlanta were chronic. Um, and most chronically homeless individuals are not staying in shelters, don't feel comfortable in shelters, have burned bridges, have trauma from staying in shelters, um, prefer to stay outside for whatever reason. And so our folks work with, with, with people wherever they are, and there's no expectation that someone needs to go into a traditional shelter in order to access services through us. Um, chronic homelessness numbers in Atlanta, um, you see, were rising from 2017 to 2020. 2021 was a unique point in time count because we didn't do an unsheltered count that year. Um, we only did a, um, or the city only did an audit of folks that were staying in shelters. Um, and you can see more people in 2021, more chronic people in 2021 were staying in shelters than the entire population experiencing homelessness in 2019. Um, so we anticipate that if we had been able to do a full count in 2021, we would have seen that um, that graph continue to increase. Um, and then in 2022, we've seen a little bit of a decline, um, and that's due to some CARES Act funding um, that came through the system and helped to house about 800 people between 2020 and 2021. Um, but that was a short term, um, injection of funds, and, and so we're seeing rises in that number again already, even just since January. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, future funding that, um, that the city may have access to that hopefully will be a little bit more longer term um, in a few minutes. So we're gonna watch a video really quick. Um, it is um, about five minutes, um, but I think that it is a really good example of um, the, the kind of work that our outreach team does with folks. Um, and so I'm gonna click play and we're gonna watch this video real quick. She loved the people, and um, they got the ball rolling for me, and I was amazed by it. I met him. Um, he's a really nice person. Um, he helps you. Um, he um, he really go out and wait for you. I conduct outreach throughout the city. We work in mostly in the fields, so we work in the streets. We have gone under bridges. We work in community clinics. Uh, we've been called to movie sets. We work in abandoned houses. 
uh, community centers. Very, very, very understanding. He has more patience than Joe for him to be a young man. I couldn't believe it. You know, having prayer and faith and praying every day. It wasn't so much a struggle anymore. He knew more resources than I could ever possibly have. I'm able to take a bath, I'm able to eat what I want to, go to bed, um, I can buy what I want to buy. I don't have nobody tell me what to do, when to do it. And I just feel good, independence, freedom. I feel like a grown person again. And I'm 56 years old. <laughs> I love working with families because um, there's always a sense of hope because you know you want these children to have every opportunity at a, at a stable life and you know uh, my favorite example so my brother-in-law um, because uh, my father-in-law had been in construction my brother-in-law uh, went to 10 different elementary schools by, by the time he was in sixth grade, I think, because they were always moving around. And it was a source of frustration. And so the idea that a child can live somewhere and that's like their forever home, it's like, oh, once you're here, this is gonna be your school and those are gonna be your friends and that's gonna be the library you're gonna bicycle to and this is, this is where you're gonna put down roots. That is just the best feeling in the world. I see that once you become an adult, you know, you can get help, but you got to kind of do it on yourself. And then when you don't have another option, then you have help. And Tracy, she is a lifesaver. She comes here and she's like, she can tell if I'm like a little dog. She'll come get him and play him home. She'll come play with him. And then she'll say, oh, what do you need? You don't need anything? Okay. And then she'll come and be like, I got something for you. I'm on my way back. And I'm like. Just normal things that, that you do all the time. It was more more exciting for me. Taking a bath, taking a bath, sleeping, putting some food in the refrigerator, cooking on the stove, because I never thought I would be homeless. Not so jittery, more calm, uh, more patient. Uh, I help others more, you know. If I go to the food bank, I have extra food, I give it to the people in the neighborhood, or someone I see on the street that might want some money, or you know, I give them some food instead. What I like mostly about it is the variety. They, they just doesn't give you, you know, canned goods. They give you fresh vegetables as well. They help you with cleaning products if they have. And that has been absolutely fantastic, knowing that fresh vegetables, that, you know, eggs, are, are going to be a, a basic staple in her household is fantastic. No problems, not worrying about, you know, why I'm not going to get put out. I'm glad I'm in the program. Um, I'm glad the program has helped me to this point, and I hope they continue to help me to this point, because without the program, I couldn't afford that apartment. I was happy. <laughs> Fixed me a good meal and took a good shower and laid on the couch and went to sleep. <laughs> I felt good. I, I couldn't believe it. It was exciting. And they were like, I had to pinch myself. Because you know, when you be so homeless for so long, it's hard to believe, you know. And still, sometimes I still can't believe it, you know. Because it can be depressing, very depressing. That where the mental part come in, that when you be homeless, you have to be strong. I would tell them, don't panic, because it's going to happen for you. It may be happening slow, it may not happen now, it may happen months, but you're going to get it. Is God always presented to you when you need it the most, not when you expect it. Don't be afraid to go ask for help. Oops. Oh, I'm going to play it again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, Miss Moody, Miss Gaines, and Miss Queen all were housed through the CARES Act funding um, that came into the city during 2020 and 2021. Um, and these are the highlight videos at our Art and Home event this fall. Um, I need to do some editing to the, um, the closed caption because the auto closed caption said that Franco um, has the patience with Joe. And um, I think what Ms. <laughs> Ms. Queen said was that he has the patience of Joe. So <laughs> I'll go in and do some editing for that. Um, but uh, those, those videos, um, those stories really show the, the direct um, and, and 
personalized experience that each of our clients has working with an in-town case manager. Um, so I'm gonna go through our homeless outreach, our homeless services um, kind of philosophy. Um, we're gonna um, have time for like five minutes of questions after homeless outreach before we go into hunger, um, just because there's there's a lot of information. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big program, there's a lot going on. So, nope, try again. There we go. Um, so in town has really piloted, created, um, and then shared with the city of Atlanta um, our homeless, it, hom homeless outreach model, which is engage, enroll, navigate, and house. Um, and really, this this started in 2016, realizing that we needed to flip um, how to get people housed on its head. Um, the traditional model of moving folks um, into a shelter expecting them to stabilize in transitional housing um, before they move into their own home really does not make sense. Um, doesn't make sense for any population. Um, and so what we follow is called the housing first model, which is <clears throat> every person deserves housing immediately. Our housing stock, our housing access in the city of Atlanta is obviously very backed up. There's not enough housing. Um, and so we can't get people into housing immediately, but we believe that every person deserves housing as soon as we can give it to them. They don't have to check boxes, they don't have to attend classes, they don't have to be employable, they don't have to be sober. They can move into housing tomorrow if we have a unit for them to move into. And that's the housing first model. The second part of that is once they move into that housing, we're gonna continue to work with them to stabilize them in whatever way that looks like. For some people, that's working on employment um, and financial stability. For others, that might be working on sobriety. For others, that might be working on accessing disability income, um, Medicaid, Medicare, um, public service benefits, um, and, and, and a housing opportunity um, that is specific for, for them as a, as a chronically a formerly chronically homeless individual, which is typically called permanent supportive housing. Um, but, the philosophy is the same for everyone, um, that every person deserves housing. Um, and so many of our clients have, have, have been homeless for 15 years, um, for a really long time, for, since before um, Housing First was part of our system and was our philosophy. And so working with those folks often takes a long time to build trust. Um, so in the engaged phase, our outreach team work to get to know people where they are staying. They go under bridges, they go into abandoned buildings. Sometimes, Chloe says no, they meet people outside of abandoned buildings and in the safety of the street. Um, uh -huh. Our insurance provider says that they don't go into abandoned buildings. <laughs> Chloe. Chloe obviously is our director of operations. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, work with clients where they are. Um, we have seen that process um, be so successful for our team that it takes less time than it used to. Our team wears these bright blue in-town outreach shirts and word has spread in the community of people experiencing homelessness that you can trust the people in the blue shirts. If they say they're gonna come back next Tuesday with snack packs and hygiene items, they're gonna come back. If they say they're gonna bring their computer and help you fill out an application for your birth certificate next week, they're gonna be there. Um, that you're not gonna have to figure out how to get to them, they're gonna get to you. They're gonna drive you to your appointment if they say they're gonna drive you to your appointment. And so that trust building for the in-town team has been absolutely integral in helping us to house the number of folks that we've housed. Um, <clears throat> on average, our team engages with an in individual experiencing homelessness nine times in this step. That's actually decreased. It's actually more like three to five times now. Um, Sometimes it's still nine, sometimes it's still a year of engagement before a person says they're ready to, to move into the enroll phase of the program. But we're there to work with them however long it takes um, and, and, and understand that every individual's experience is, is unique. Um, <clears throat> we then move them into the enroll phase of our program where we assess what their needs are. As we said, housing first um, means that every person deserves homelessness immediately. There are about four documents that are required for most people to move into housing, and that's your birth certificate, your state issued ID, your social security card, um, and a disability verification form if you're chronically homeless. And so getting those four documents can take time, especially if you're born in another state, dealing with the New York Department of um, Vital Records for birth certificates is its own beast. Um, and so depending on what state you're in, that, that phase could take a little bit longer. 
Um, but once a person says they're ready to enroll in our program and be housed, we enroll them and then that is all part of the navigate phase. We help them to get those documents. We help them to access health care, to access mental health care. If they want to access um, uh, addiction services, um, any other support that they may need during that navigation phase, our case managers are working with them on an ongoing basis, meeting with them at least weekly, but often far more regularly than weekly, um, and making sure that they have access to the support services that they need. They also, at that point, go on to what's called the queue. Um, it is a really long list of people experiencing homelessness in the city of Atlanta um, that are in line for housing. For the majority of our clients, permanent supportive housing um, is going to be the solution for, for permanent housing for them. Um, and that is ongoing housing where they're never going to be expected to pay more than 30% of their income if they have disability income. Um, and, and they're going to have ongoing long-term case management for their entire life. Um, those spots are limited. Um, people don't move out of permanent supportive housing often. There is work being done to add a significant portion or a significant amount of permanent supportive housing to the city, but that does not happen overnight. Um, and so right now, there are somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people on the queue in the city of Atlanta. There are probably somewhere between four and 500 chronically homeless individuals on that list. Um, and the majority of our clients fall into that category. So during the Navigate phase, in addition to supporting clients on a, on a daily and weekly basis, our outreach workers are advocating for them to be moved up that queue um, to be housed as quickly as possible in the most appropriate option, um, most appropriate opportunity. And then when that housing becomes available, we help our client determine if that's the right fit for them and then move them to their long-term supportive services case management. Um, we don't make people move into the first unit available if it's not the right fit for them. Sometimes a unit will come available um, and um, it's back in the neighborhood where that person used and they've been sober for two and a half years. And they say, if I move back into this neighborhood, I know I'm gonna use again. And so we go back to the city and we say, this isn't the right fit for them. We really think they're gonna be more successful over here. We're gonna wait for this unit to open up. And so recognizing that maybe another month or two in their experience of homelessness is going to help them to be stable long-term, um, there's value to that. And so we're not just shoving people into the first apartment that we can find for them. <clears throat> Um, so, over, um, yeah, okay, so in 2021, so last calendar year, we engaged 656 people, that getting to know you phase, trying to build trust. We enrolled 315 new clients, so, so 315 of those 656 said, yes, I'm ready to start the process of moving towards housing navigated 497 that means that navigation phase was still ongoing from the previous year for almost 200 clients um, and we're continuing to work with them to in their experience of homelessness um, <clears throat> and we housed 221 clients from okay we run on a fiscal year it's the bane of Chloe's existence um, <laughs> but so from our during that that last fiscal year, from July of 20 to June of 2021, we housed 221 people. From during the last calendar year, we housed 292 people. And that increase in that like, that that inconsistency and, and jump is due to that CARES Act funding and getting to get people into housing more quickly because of that. <clears throat> we have 14 case managers on our team um, and the average time enrolled is currently between five and seven months. Again, that was decreased because of the CARES Act funding. It's probably back up closer to nine months now, but we're hoping that um, the new American Rescue Plan dollars that are coming into the system and into the city will help us to, to drop that um, time enrolled again. Um, homeless services, questions. We'll take about five minutes and do questions if anybody has them before we move to, how, or to hunger. Yes. Sure. 
Yeah, so the question is, um, because we know that the, the barriers that lead to chronic homelessness are often addiction, mental health concerns, things like that, how do we work with folks while they're on the housing queue, while they're in the Navigate phase to get them those services? Yeah, so we do have one, um, one grant um, where one of our case managers and an aftercare specialist work with Mercy Care, which is one of the clinics in town, um, and that is a grant specifically working with folks experiencing addiction. Um, and there's funding in that program to get people into substance abuse treatment programs if they're interested, um, <clears throat> long-term support in substance abuse in lots of different ways. But we also follow a harm reduction model, and so we don't have any requirement that, that a client be ready to access substance abuse treatment to, to access that program. So if someone wants to get sober, if someone wants to stop using, they can, and we can work with them to, to do that, but it's not a requirement for the program. And then same, uh, mental health is you know, a huge issue for, for so many people. It's difficult for us to find good therapists as you know, wealthy middle and upper middle class people. Um, can, can you imagine <laughs> trying to build rapport with a therapist while also experiencing homelessness? Um, but we have relationships with Mercy Care, with um, Good Samaritan, um, with other mental health providers that we work to, to get our clients um, into services with whether or not they're insured um, and to, to help them work to stabilize those mental health um, issues, whether, whether, whether that be through medication, whether that be through you know, behavioral support, all of those things. Um, that does happen during the Navigate phase. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a couple questions. <clears throat> One about the criteria for admission to the program. Mm -hmm. It sounded like for some of the documents you were asking for, that citizenship might be one of the criteria. So, uh, does that mean you're excluding uh, undocumented? That's, that's one question. Mm -hmm. The other question, some of these chronic homeless people, like those who have been 15 years or so, um, you know, these people who are kind of nomadic in their lifestyle, they really aren't interested mm -hmm. in uh, living in a home. Yeah, those are two really good questions. So the first question was about citizenship. Do people have to be U.S. citizens in order to access our program? Um, and the answer to that is no, but we do work within the system that exists. And so some of the housing solutions are exclusions um, for folks who may not be citizens, um, and we work to get access to housing that will not exclude them. So permanent supportive housing does require those four documents. Some other housing options do require those four documents. But we work with um, and will connect with agencies that will be able to help provide access to housing for folks who may not be able to get those four documents. Um, we also work really hard to figure out just unique solutions um, to things. Um, Franco, who was mentioned in the story above, um, had a client who was legally dead for five years um, because of a clerical error. And so um, he did some really unique work um, to help prove that she was not dead. Uh, before she was able to move into housing. And so, um, yeah, our, our team is, is well-versed in, in helping folks who either can't access documentation or um, have really bizarre situations going on with their documentation. Um, and then the second question, remind me. What about people who may not be interested yes. in the nomadic lifestyle? Yeah, so there's, I mean, and, and this, is, th this is true. There are some people who, um, who are choosing to live outside. Um, and sometimes they are choosing to live outside because they, they prefer that lifestyle. But a lot of times what we find is that people say they are choosing to live outside because they have been hurt and burned by the system so often that they don't believe that there's gonna be a way to get themselves housed or to get themselves into a, into a permanent situation. And so they've just decided that, that that's the lifestyle that they're gonna live. Um, and we work with those clients too. And, and often um, that, that rapport building is years long before someone says, you know what, it might be nice to have a place to, to call my own or a bed to sleep in when it's pouring down rain. Um, one of our case managers also runs a side nonprofit called Mad Housers. Um, and in that project, um, she and her nonprofit build um, like shed-like shelters on typically private property that's been offered to them to build shelters on um, for folks who maybe are in that situation where they're like, I'm good, um, but, but it would be nice to have a roof over my head when it's pouring down rain or when it's snowing outside. Um, and so we, we do work with folks who, who 
either do or have felt that way in the past. Yes, Jennifer. so special is that we're a neighborhood-based organization founded by church and synagogue and community leaders. Going
going back to our predecessor, we've been serving this community for more than 40 years. So there's a lot of community leadership and buy-in. There's community support from city council members, faith congregations, neighborhood associations, schools and PTAs, scout groups, urban gardeners, residents, and volunteers. People are really struggling in this neighborhood. And there are also people who have time and talents and means and choose to be in relationship and be a part of stepping into the gap and serving the whole neighborhood. We have a number of guests who come by who are sleeping outside. We also have a lot of guests who are families working families with kids, lots of intergenerational families, grandparents, parents, children, all living under the same household with different nutritional needs. We ramped up things pretty quickly, totally changed our model, and we get a lot more food out to a lot more people. We partnered with the Atlanta Community Food Bank and a network of local farmers to get thousands of cases of fresh produce out to our families. Like a lot of agencies around the country, we're working to fill needs today and also projecting ahead to see what's next, to ask what does hunger look like going forward with unemployment increasing and evictions on the horizon. We have met the needs of every single person who has come to us and we can continue to do that with your help. services and we said that's 
not what in town is going to do we're going to figure out how to get food to people safely and so we moved to being an outdoor model we decreased our volunteers on site seven at a time we masked until three months ago mandatory masked until like three months ago um, and really worked to get as much food out to people as possible the video that we watched um, was filmed and put together in august of 2020 in September of 2020, MARTA started charging again for rides. MARTA had been free from April of 2020 through August of 2020 um, as a pandemic response for buses. Um, and in September, they put their charge back on buses and we saw our numbers like plummet. Um, and we realized that getting to the food pantry was a barrier. And if we were going to be truly low barrier, we would need to change our model. And so the language that we've used around that model, the same language that like the USPS and Amazon use about the last mile problem, um, getting food to people instead of getting people to the food um, became a big thing. And so we moved to a, um, and, and built and grew a delivery program. Um, and that has, has been managed in a lot of different ways um, uh, over the last, years now um, but the, the gist of it is that that you don't even have to be able to get to the pantry to need food obviously or to have food insecurity and so we're gonna get food to you however however we can make that happen and so um, we now have a partnership with Amazon that delivers about 150 um, bags of food to folks every week um, we also have a network of volunteers that deliver another hundred or so bags of food every week um, and um, and then we also still have our twice a week walk-up pantry. Um, those numbers don't add up. I, I think Amazon does about 100. We have about another 100 um, that get delivered by volunteers and then about 100 that still come to the pantry for walk-up at least once a week, if not twice a week. Um, and so, yeah.
Um, so the growth of the delivery program, our Amazon partnership has been absolutely huge. Um, community support services is our dream. We would like for people to be able to um, not only get food at the pantry, but access other services that could help them to stabilize at the pantry. Folks who are not homeless, but are um, housing insecure or are employment insecure, um, our dream is to have um, some community support at the pantry along with food. Um, and then um, on the outreach side of things, I forgot to mention this earlier, um, our neighborhood partnership. So this year we have embedded two case managers in neighborhoods or in programs. So we have a case manager that's specific to the geographic neighborhood of Midtown and is working specifically with people experiencing homelessness in that neighborhood. And then we have um, a case manager that is embedded in the Church of the Common Ground, which is a worshiping community through the Episcopal Diocese, um, mostly of folks experiencing homelessness or formerly experiencing homelessness in downtown. Um, and our case manager, since being embedded in that community in January, has already housed 19 folks. Um, and so we're, we're really excited about that. I'm running out of time, um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do a question um, block right now. Um, I'm going to move into transforming the world um, because I think that that ties all of this together with in town and who we are and then we'll have hopefully a couple minutes for questions at the end. Um, pastoral accompaniment. Um, it's an interesting term. Um, it's a term that the in town um, founders used um, to describe um, our philosophy of how we wanted to walk alongside the definitions online that I can find um, are a Catholic definition and a Lutheran definition. The Catholic definition really seems to be more focused on spiritual life coaching, um, but it is the concept of walking alongside um, a less experienced person um, to increase their, their faith maturity. The Lutheran example that I found fits, fits what we do a little bit more. Um, accompaniment thus emphasizes relationship before resources. Um, development of programs and allocation of resources flow from how companions relate rather than vice versa. Accompaniment is valued for its own sake as well as for its results. It's open-minded with no foregone conclusions. The companions learn together in the journey. Accompaniment binds companions more closely to their Lord and further informs their mission. And I think that definition of pastoral accompaniment really, really lives into what we do with, um, with the outreach program. Um, our case managers are not there to say, I have all of the answers and this is the way to get you housed. They are there to walk alongside a client and say, tell me about your journey, tell me about your experience, tell me about your life, and I also have access to these resources and so if and when you're ready to walk this path with me, we can do that. Um, and, and we've, we've been really lucky to have a team of what Chloe calls our magical unicorns um, that can live into that pastoral accompaniment model, regardless of their faith backgrounds. Um, it's not, we're, you know, we, our, our roots are in, um, in um, interdenominational and interfaith um, church leadership, um, but most of our team are, are not people of faith, and that's okay, or, or not like vocally people of faith. A lot of them I don't even know. Um, about their, their faith experience because they can live into this regardless of that. Um, on the other, and then the second thing I want to talk about um, is um, a quote from Robert Lupton. Robert Lupton talks about asset based community development a lot, um, but what a quote that he, um, that he mentions in Toxic Charity, which is a good primer if you, you know, are starting the process of, of redefining mission. Um, there's a lot more that can be said, but, but talk to charity is a good starting point. Um, we've been evaluating our charity by the rewards we receive through service rather than the benefits received by the served. Instead of emotional, economic, and cultural outcomes on the receiving end of our charity, instead, emotional, economic, and cultural outcomes on the receiving end of our charity should be our basis for defining successful mission. Um, and so I think that that, that concept is one that we really live into at the food pantry. Um, that, um, that, that we are doing the work really to, to be the hands and feet, not to make ourselves feel better, not 
to check the box of church ministry, not to check the box of transforming the world, um, but really to impact um, impact the, the well-being and the success of folks in our community. So those are the two things that um, I'm going to end on. Um, here's a few pictures of Glenn engagement at in town. There's so much Glenn engagement in town. It was fun to try and figure out which pictures I was going to pull from. Um, but time for questions on food, on transforming the world, on any of it. I got six minutes. Yeah. To us, um, they are working on growing their um, their. It, it's a it's a. I don't even know how to explain it. Yeah, Jeff Bezos is trying to make his his yacht um, his yacht purchase and dismantling of a bridge look better. I don't know. Um, no, but basically Amazon came to us and, and about 10 other, maybe 20 other food pantries across the U.S. that they had um, done some research on and found out that we were doing a delivery style program. And they offered their Amazon Flex drivers to help us deliver that food. And so, um, yeah, it's something that um, we've given them an in-kind sponsorship to um, for, for Heart and Home and things like that. But it's something that they, it's a program that they've created. Um, to support the community, um, and it really, really helps us out. Um, if you were following our social media, you know, a year or two years ago, you were seeing us constantly needing more delivery drivers, and we were having to limit who we could take food to because of where they lived, because, you know, if someone was housed in Mableton, we couldn't necessarily reasonably send a volunteer driver out there, but, um, but Amazon can do that and can have a driver. They're paying their drivers, um, to to come and pick up the food, but we are not paying them for the to, for the for the work. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I was, you said you had about six hundred people out that you're in contact with for month. How do you keep track of this? Yeah, our case managers have caseloads of about forty um, typically, and um, and they keep up. They keep up with that in um, the Homeless Management Information System, HMIS system, um, that is run through the city of Atlanta. That's also the database that the housing queue is housed in um, and that case management notes um, get housed in. So anytime an outreach worker meets someone new, um, they put a very basic um, client uh, profile in the system, and then when that person enrolls and starts the navigation process, that um, is built out and the client is put on the housing queue for the city of Atlanta. So, and we have a magical data analyst that um, manages all of that for us. Yeah. Yeah, outreach is specific to the city of Atlanta um, right now, except for one of our grants. We have one grant, our, the, the substance abuse um, partnership through Mercy Care can serve DeKalb County. Um, but other than that, all of our grants are specific to the city of Atlanta currently. You had a question, yeah. So there's been a lot of uh, memes related to just the horrific <clears throat> housing properties that are out there and the poor property management. Are you able to navigate that or would you then say, oh, here's a great property? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, we have a housing specialist on our team that does a lot of landlord engagement um, and working with landlords to understand who our clients are and what their experience might be if one of our clients moves into their property. He's really spectacular. He's out on paternity leave right now, and we are, um, are we are we are chomping at the bit for him to be back. Um, but uh, we also with with the, like these these large housing initiatives like the CARES Act um, and hopefully the um, uh, American Rescue Plan Act funding that are coming in. There is an agency whose entire job will be to do that landlord engagement and talk to property owners um, about the types of clients that are coming in, 
um, and also holding those property owners accountable for maintaining appropriate housing for, um, for our clients. social media for sure because um, we do um, have some of those opportunities um, a good example there was a bill that came up in state legislation um, early um, in, in February um, that was talking about um, kind of formalized homeless encampments it's a concept that came out of a conservative think tank in Texas and it's a horrible idea um, and so we did a lot of very vocal advocacy to, to push back against that um, our executive director is currently on the, what committee is he on for Partners for Home? The Governance Committee for Partners for Home. Partners for Home is the manager of our continuum of care. Um, we are um, in touch with a lot of city councilors and are working yeah. to, um, to get some meetings with the mayor. Um, we would like to be more vocally involved in um, local policy and management. Um, we just have to meet the right people and get in the right doors. So we're still small. We're still, you know, only an 11 year old small organization and we're making a name for ourselves in the city. So, yeah. Other questions? It is 1045. Awesome, well, thank y'all so much. I have loved being here. I can talk about this stuff for way, way, way too long. Um, so I'm proud of myself for keeping it to an hour. Um, <laughs> And I really appreciate it. Um, if y'all have other questions, feel free to come up and ask me. Um, we would love for, um, for y'all to um, volunteer. If you've got kids, I'll be here in August doing a kids learning exercise um, with, um, with the kids and youth. Um, and um, would just love to um, engage y'all in any other way that y'all are interested. So. Thanks, friends. addressing short-term problems, long-term solutions to those problems, education, advocacy, and personal connection. In town does it all. So thank you again. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.